Yeah. So the first question itself is, uh, how do we deal with the package management, right? Uh, like I'm, I'm just touching the basics here. Uh, like we can look into the code, feel free to shoot questions, any, any anything. So usually people sort of mix up the config loading in main itself. Like in, in Go, the idiomatic thing is, hey, under CMD, uh, you put different kind of applications. It could be CMD server, it could be a CMD uh, worker, <clears throat> or it could be some um, agent, anything, that kind of stuff. And then main is our regular flow, right? And uh, uh, so in this case, uh, it's easier to sort of have the configuration here itself but the problem is the config is referred by multiple packages. Uh, I'll be referring it in, let's say, uh, ping uh, users. Like I'll, I'll give a context on this, but yeah, just, just one second, I'll, I'll give a context on that. But the package is sort of used across. So in a sense, uh, it is not exactly an anti-pattern in, in a sense that it's equivalent to utils or a models, but rather, anything um, I sort of see it as a, anything like which deal with the configuration in this case, loading uh, in this case, it could be uh, unmarshalling or uh, uh, converting into different required configs into the config. And like the, the reason I sort of have a separate package is right now you can have a ENV variable, but you can move it to YAML or a different uh, kind of uh, library as well. So in that case, having, a separate package and uh, having a particular struct and then a load module. Like, like I sort of see this as a three thing. Like, like one is whatever application uh, requires, you define uh, a, a struct for it. And then the configure this, this is a mandatory configuration to bootstrap your application. Then you have a loader logic. Like this could be loading from YAML or ENV variable or anything. And then we pass this application across packages as needed. Uh, this is just a like a bootstrapping config. I'll, I'll sort of differentiate the other kind of configs as well. But in terms of HTTP servers, in this case, uh, this simple API is just doing a ping pong response. And then it has some auth mechanism where we just connect to DB. But in super high level, like, like some user listing, some ping pong uh, ping, and then it responds with pong. Uh, and then we have a DB uh, to deal with, that's it. So in this case, as you can see, um, I want a port, I want a host, and then uh, the scheme as well. And then uh, the database configuration. So in this case, like, I have a, like I'll come to this in a bit, why this is different package. Um, this is just to sort of express the other intent, but in, in a high level, we would have a struct and then we would be loading uh, the configuration and then returning this application. So in main, how would it look like as this, hey, just do a load. And then I bootstrap the server with the configuration. And then here I would be using uh, the configuration as needed. So let's say uh, here I'm using config app address, right? So, so there is multiple bits and pieces, which is like, like there is different kinds of thing I'm doing here, right? So I'll just add it here. Uh, one is config has a struct. This is one. Uh, different package has a struct, uh, which is in this case dp dbi.config. I'll, I'll come to this. And then there is uh, some function uh, which is exposed uh, in the config package. Uh, and then obviously load or must load. Uh, like. So these are the like, like different things which is going on, right? Uh, so th this is straightforward, right? Like I think like, it's really nice to have a struct. If, if you use a flag, let's say, uh, you can have a simple variables and then you can pass around the variables. But the problem is right now, my server is, doesn't have HTTPS protocol, but the moment I add a HTTPS protocol, I would need cert configuration as well. And in certificates configuration, it could be uh, CA certificates, uh, the client, uh, the, the key in PEM and everything, but I can also have add configuration more and more. So in that case, this particular server, uh, which is depending on this config application, uh, it could be just config dot, let's say server. Uh, it's easier to pass a struct, uh, which, which can be, uh, like extended rather than passing four or five variables. So here I could have just passed 
host and address, right? So that's why it's easier to sort of have a struct. Uh, the second bit is uh, like, like th this is, I'll, I'll come to this in a bit. Why do we, like, would you choose a function like this? You can call it like a singleton or a config uh, package function. Or would you also always prefer parsing struct across all the packages, right? So in this case, what I choose is uh, if you need to do any custom, like you you never change the config first of all, like treat this like a finalized or a constant values. Uh, you should never read the once you read the configuration, you should never touch it or change it. Like that's that's sort of like a standard. But now, right, uh, I don't really bother about the struct details in server starting as long as I have the address. So in this case, uh, it is just now host and uh, port. Uh, but let's say, hey, um, one second. Uh, in this case, uh, it's just host and port. But I, if you add an additional example of, let's say, uh, you are connecting to a database, while connecting to a database, you would have seen um, it has a DB name, it has a DB port, as well as credentials, username, and password, along with uh, some disabled mode, SSL mode, and all of that. So in that case, in our application, we don't really bother about the specifics of the configuration, but rather what I'm interested in is only the URL, or uh, in that case, like, like the DB connection URL. Uh, I, I can go on with additional example. Feel free to shoot if you still like have questions. Other examples could be is uh, you are uh, pointing to a let's say uh, external services. You just need to bother about the base URL. I don't really bother about a what is the protocol, what is this, and all of that, right? In in terms of a client. So in those cases, I prefer uh, this kind of funk. So in server context, app address for a DB, it's a DB connection URL. Uh, but other things like let's say hey user uh, specific config let's say I'm, I'm adding something like a user specific config um, this uh, could have multiple embedded values in it right so let's say um, I have this auth enabled so and then let's say uh, uh, flow, uh, some, some string. These are all uh, needed for the code flow to decide uh, whether you want to do the auth or not. So in this case, I wouldn't really just expose a function on saying whether auth enabled or not. Later on, I could say hey, whether the user is super user, whether it's an internal call, whether it's a public call, all of that, I can do a multiple flow and then the that auth package could deal with the uh, handling of uh, the flow. So mostly you would pass structs around. If you don't need the struct specifics, uh, just use a func. Uh, so in that case, it's easier to also test it because it's easier to sort of make a mistake on creating the JDBC uh, like database URL in different packages, but rather the code is sort of pulled out here and then you sort of test it, right? So I can create a test saying, um, read the database config and then verify the URL is always the same. And the moment why, as long as I use this func across packages, I think you're good to go. So that's the second bit. Um, I'll just go to the blah. The third bit is, uh, when do you decide on like whether to have this struct, uh, within this config package or do you uh, have the struct in a different kind, different packages. Uh, there is two cases to it. Uh, so one is the package itself becomes like a component, uh, or you can treat it as like, like for libraries case or for, uh, external clients, HTTP client, or like in general, you call it a client. I uh, want to call a remote service. Uh, in that case, it could be gRPC. It could be HTTP. It could be HTTPS. Uh, but all of this requires some configuration and I wouldn't use the config package to have the struct, but rather this is passed from the code flow. Uh, I mean, you still have to get the configuration, but this 
could be based on other configuration, right? So usually what we would do is uh, uh, just a second. I had a quote. Yeah, so in this case, I would usually prefer a climb.new with a configuration. Uh, you can use a functional options as well, but how you read these configurations is, is not part of this, right? But, but rather the configuration is meant for that particular package. And then you customize the usage of that package with the config defined in that. Um, I mean, I'm, 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 I hope I'm making sense. So it's like, if you create a client for, let's say G cloud, uh, if you create a client for AWS, the configs are defined in that because it's external library in a similar way, you can sort of isolate the package usage and then how it's defined based on the domain and business context. And then same way you can separate the configuration example auth, if it's super complex. Uh, if you have, let's say, OAuth or YubiKey and, and different kind of thing, the auth module itself could take a config struct while initializing or creating uh, the struct which will be used later on. So in the same way, uh, the DB, right? Like I have used a, a different package. Here, I just wanted, like, like here, we don't have a, uh, like other uh, functionalities. But the reason I, I pulled out it is this could be even a separate uh, different Go module itself because all of your services in whole org would be talking to, let's say, MySQL Postgres. And the configuration will mostly be same. Like, of course, with, within team, you can sort of define, hey, uh, I'll be using this config uh, module, uh, which gives me a connection to a database. So in this case, uh, I don't really need to bother about defining all of this again and again, but rather you define the whole, uh, everything which is required for, uh, connecting to a Postgres, be it through, uh, SSL or just with username and password, or even without password with same defaults. And this you could use across different services. So in this case, as I said, right, like the URL is part of this and mostly while creating uh the other dependencies uh we usually give out uh just a database url or uh the configuration like just for connection and just for uh dealing with uh creating new connection pools and stuff so you don't really bother about these fields uh but like you sort of club it right database the connect configuration for that is within that package itself and then if you take like G cloud or AWS package, the config is within that. And then you define uh, methods on that particular config and then you use it as needed, right? So here, even creating database, this could be like something which is uh, like good to share because the, the reason is I've seen some services having a uh, connection leak because they don't really handle connection pool properly. So in this case, you can move the config there, but the functionality you also you extract it in the right place. So I'll, I'll come to this again. Um, so you usually group the uh, struct like variables or configurations in a struct. It's easier to pass a struct rather than a single variables. Uh, you expose function in config if you don't really bother about the specific variables in the config because I can form a URL from the variables based on some custom need. Uh, you decide a separate package or external library. If it's external library, it's clear. If you, you can decide external package or internal package to have its own configuration, if the config is complex enough, because you don't want to have auth depending on config as well. Uh, so you sometimes have to avoid the cyclomatic complexity as well. So in that sense, you have to have the uh, uh, definitions defined in that configurations. Uh, the last bit is you just need to figure out, Hey, whether while loading configuration, right? Uh, like still now we have not talked about the code, but, uh, like we'll, we'll get into it. There is just two means of co loading configuration. One is must load. The other is like, uh, Hey, you load and then handle error. So like, as it stands, like if you don't have the configuration, which is required for your application, let's say a hey, port to run or a particular protocol to run, uh, you can kill the server because this is sort of mandatory. So it is like, like here you can say that, Hey, this should always return an error, 
but if you consider uh, this is sort of mandatory you can use this approach but if not uh, you can convert this to let's say um, uh, uh, error uh, and then you return errors to the caller but usually this error is something which we can't handle so in that case uh, you can have this uh, kind of must load so in that sense your main uh, wouldn't look uh, like like error handling, like you don't need additional error handling. It's going to be the same. So in that case, you can choose to panic as well, just for a configuration, uh, because usually we avoid panic, but yeah, you load config. If the config is not available, your services can't run. So you just do a log fatal and then uh, uh, stop the server. Uh, I, I can talk about the code and libraries and stuff, but any questions on how this is structured? why uh, this config package is here, uh, feel free to shoot. I can take questions, I'll just stop here. Uh, any questions? So you I, yeah, go on, sorry. I, I have, hi, uh, my name is Abhay. So uh, I have a question that you're using functions uh, to pass on new instances of struts, right? Madlab, you don't want mutability. Uh, or, or that's other, or that is another reason for it. So, I mean, mutability, like since you mentioned it, we are, we won't share a struct and then the structs shouldn't be changed in the code flow because these- And hence that's right? the agenda for functions, right? That, that, that's uh, the agenda of the functions, right? You're saying? Uh, not really. Like I can even say, hey, I, I can return a pointer. Like nobody is gonna stop uh, you from writing a function which returns this. But what I meant is treat this like a Definitely. simple function where I don't need a, uh, the config structs or a dependency on config, but rather you just need the address. So in this case, uh, like I can go into any func and then let's say uh, I can define this and then I will have this. So this is what I mean. So this is different than okay. passing it. So in this case, there is an additional benefit, right? Uh, this goes, uh, the, the dependency doesn't have to be passed in the, the flow mm -hmm. as well. You, you get what I'm saying, right? So let's say, hey, if you take a database, if you take a service dependency, you always have to pass it in the handler, handler in turn, pass yes, yes, I do. or anything. But if you create this kind of expose or exported function, uh, you don't have an explicit mm -hmm. dependency on config itself. As you can see, uh, like the moment I add it, uh, like config uh, is gone. That's that's the bit. There is there, there is additional benefit to this rather than it's more of a usage okay. rather than uh, just saying hey, uh, like like hey use this in this way or other way. Like you you can have a look at some applications and then you will get to know like you can use it in both ways is what I mean by that. Uh, like the other alternatives, let's say you can define uh, server s, and then let's say pass an address, and then this in turn uh, doing the same thing. Uh, you can do the same stuff, um, but in this case, you mm -hmm. will have to pass the server in the modules or packages wherever you need it, and then that in turn can call it. Like this almost looks like. Hey, uh, you add an additional functionality, you can validate and then call something. Uh, but this just removes the need for passing this uh, configuration or have need to have a dependency on the config itself. Yeah. Um, am I like, like, is my audio clear or is it uh, better? Dinesh, hello? Yeah. Hi. No. No. No, 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 no. I was saying that uh, your screen is getting stuck and audio is not clear, but I understood the uh, whole spirit of it. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, I think there's just lag. No, I'll take questions without sharing the um, a screen. Uh, let me know. But, but I understood. So, so you want uh, actually just the address to be passed. That's an immutable form, not the pointers. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Super high level. Like, don't pass point. Like, like. I mean, this is a different statement. You don't need always at all uh, in your application unless you really need to change the struct in in the flow. Because I've seen people passing 
uh, a pointer thinking this would save me memory, but I've seen it being like, like it will sort of confuse me. Hey, is the flow sort of going to change the configuration? That, that's a different thing. In this case, like load the config, even though it's big, just give a value based, uh, we pass it by value and then you are fine. Like it's, it's perfectly fine. Understood, understood. So the development becomes very complex while debugging, while you start passing pointers. Correct, correct, correct. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, somebody had something like, come on, uh, you can shoot. So I had one other thing to add to the uh, pointer thing. Yep. So while passing pointers also, I mean, uh, sometimes if you forget to, you know, be reference to a struct or something, which is uh, you know being uh, populated in the request or something, so it could it could cause some memory leak, which could be very difficult to debug. Entire process of debugging becomes very complex if you start passing pointers, irrespective of memory leak. It's become frustrating. Yeah. So I've seen applications like it could be as simple as. Uh, you're looping through a, a variable and then you're using a pointer, but it can mess up your whole code. And then you would see issues like I've, like I've debugged, sp spent so much time on others code and then figured out, hey, it's misuse of pointers. Uh, but rarely we bother out memory, right? I, I, I don't remember an instance where I was bothered with, hey, you're using too much memory for a binary or our application. So yeah. <laughs> um, any, any other questions on this config uh, bit? Like, hey, which ones to choose, or like just just the high level bits, anything. Like, so if you're writing to CLI, you would use a flag. If you're writing application, you would use a, a library and then load it and then to start. Initial voice is cracking actually. Uh, yeah, I think my internet is bad. Let me just switch my host. Uh, sure, uh, network is this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's... Hey, uh, is it better now? Oh, okay. Hey, it's my bad, my bad. Just give me one sec. Uh, like I was connected to VPN. Uh, that screwed up the uh, connectivity. Just, just give me a. Hey, uh, can you hear me now? Is it clear? Hey, am I audible? Hey, folks, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. It, it, this is better, right? Extremely. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Like I had my VPN, no, no, no. Uh, which sort of messed up the whole thing. Uh, I was surprised. Okay, cool. Now this should be clear. Uh, yes. We'll we'll get back to this. So in this case, I I like like there is different kinds of defining configuration. That that's this, and then there is different like just just super high level practices you can use. Um, but I think if your org sort of define the structure, I think you wouldn't worry about it. This which one to use? Uh, but mostly, hey, how do you load it? How do you use it across and things like that? Uh, just an additional point, right? Like, like I'll, I'll clarify, like I also mentioned it earlier. Don't read this as like an anti-pattern where it's a, a utils package or a models package. Uh, this does additional bits of loading. Like I'll give you an example. Today you have, you're using, uh, let's say Viper. Uh, that's super complex. You want to replace it with some of the libraries. Uh, all you need to do is touch one particular package and you're, you're all good to go. And, and same way, if you define, uh, the address, or if you define the structs there, you change it here and then you're sorted everywhere. Uh, like the same goes for logging, we'll, we'll add there. But um, it's, 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 I mean, you, you sort of do it intuitively, right? It's, it's, it's a different thing. Um, but for components, right? Uh, sorry, um, sure. Uh, but for, con for components or for a code flow, 
like you try to use a configuration which is defined in uh, their own packages. Um, so I wouldn't say, hey, if you're creating uh, like a new service, uh, you don't need to have a service configuration in the config package, but rather it's defined internally. Uh, like just, just probably will go here. Uh, I have a new service. Um, and then here we are doing some new service. Uh, here we are just taking DB configuration, but if we want to add additional configuration, which is specific to this package, I would be defining that config here. Uh, and then usually use functional options uh, to override that. Or like, like that, that's sort of the uh, idiomatic uh, way of doing things. Uh, that's this last line. Uh, there are multiple libraries which is available for loading. I personally love env config uh, because yeah, now I can get to the code. Um, because all you need to do is define a, a config struct, uh, and then you don't really need to write any complex code. Uh, and then the code is available, like, like the config is loaded into the struct. So in this case, uh, I sort of have a, like I'll, I'll show the env variable first, um, like this is just for the demo purpose, right? So I have a prefixed, like, as you could see, uh, this is clubbed. This is sort of easier to find. Like I, I personally like prefixing uh, env variables for modules or for a domain with a prefix. Uh, two things, one is it's easier to search, like, like even in prod and things like that. The other thing is even this could be like, let's say server host and server port, et cetera. Uh, and then all of this sort of converts into a particular struct. So if you take this particular thing uh, and then let's go here, um, like, like we'll just look at the mappings. Um, we don't need to define any extra code to read it. Like, like in Viper, I've seen so many applications reading env variables manually and then sort of putting in a struct uh, and then converting types as well. But the library takes care of dealing with the types and then also like, like standardize it. So in this case, um, uh, let's go here. So I have a server and like, like before this, let's say, hey, if I go here, uh, I have a host and then I have a user, uh, but I have mentioned prefixing DB to load all this configuration. So you would have a DB host, this maps to this and this, uh, DB password is this, uh, and then DB port is this. Uh, and Max, th this is another interesting bit. Uh, let's say if I want to add a DB max idle connection, let's say, hey, max uh, connection life, uh, lifetime thing. This will be defined in a, sorry, this will be a caps. Um, the camel case sort of converts into underscores and then this splits the word. So you can say that, like, like I always have splits words true for all the uh, variables. So in this case, um, it becomes export DB SSL mode. And then you just need to say something. Uh, this is much more convenient. The last bit is I think we need overriding. So the standardize it, you can add a prefix and the last bit is overriding. Let's say, hey, for some reason, uh, I use SSL mode already in my application. Uh, let's call this, let's say a uh, PG SSL mode. Uh, you can override this with uh, env variable. So, um, so in this case, I have defined env config port. So if I remove this, it, it, it will, uh, be different. Like this is sort of in a root level. Uh, in the same way, you can define a env config uh, and then call it pg uh, ssl mode. And then this will map that, that particular key uh, into the struct. So you pretty much have all the stuff you want in this. And then the loading becomes super simple, uh, which is just uh, like I'm, I'm, I haven't like I, like I haven't figured out nested structs like it supports it. But I think I just like the naming convention this way. So in a root level, I load the uh, configuration. Like I usually have server and port as a prefix, but the reason I have uh, uh, not prefixed it is because some deployment applications, like let's say, uh, uh, I don't know, DigitalOcean or other application, it requires port and host as a simple variable. So that's why I sort of had that. Uh, the DB is prefixed with this. And then as you can see, you can change it to even PG. And then all you require is 
uh, changing your local .env file uh, to uh, db to let's say pg underscore, and then this should still work. So um, I hope the like you can follow the commands. Like I'll, I'll also enable this. Then I stop. Yeah. One question. This yes. Is one question. Like uh, when you write in uh, process without any uh, prefix, then will it load all the environment variables? Uh, no, so so while uh, what, what do you mean it will load all the environment? It will load the env in variables and map it to these particular stuff. That's it, right? Uh, so it will look for uh, env variables with this particular prefix. So without any prefix, how will it know that which one is prefixed and which one is not prefixed? Okay, correct. Without so, any like yeah, that, that's sort of a different question, right? So by default. Uh, in the VM, you would have too many variables. The application or the code logic have access to it. So in this case, I have too many things. So let's say in a deployed VM, right, you will have the env variables required for uh, Postgres internal Postgres, and then you would have it for, let's say, some syslog. Additionally, you would have extra variables defined. So in this case, I will have to do a source local.env, and then if I do env uh, this, you can see, right, like the same env would have my configuration as well. So you can see, right, so this should be done first. Like this is sort of like the deployment process, like if you do it, and then the application just reads it. So if I do this, this should be available. Uh, the same thing, right? So everything should be loaded first, and then um, you, read it and then you just map it so the library is just a nice thing like you are not uh, mapping it by yourself and then you are not uh, figuring out in what platform how to read it and things like that uh, you can internally say hey os.getenv and then sort of map it to this particular variable and things like that but this is just nice way of writing right that's it so in this case like again like i have loaded it and then now if i try to run it uh, this should run seamlessly uh, without any issue. Yeah, sorry. I have defined SSL mode. Yeah. I'll just try to run it. Yeah, and then I, I say curl, and then it works. So in this case, right, um, like right now it is um, using PG, but earlier I had a different DB configuration. Um, so let's say I uh, do a source local and then I do a run again. Uh, yeah, okay, just one minor bit. So I have to create a new uh, um, tab or terminal because the in variables which I've sourced is already available there. So because of which it worked, now it should uh, fail because it says, hey, PG host is not available. So usually it's a, even a better thing to have, like not have exports uh, within your local uh, file or env file. While starting, you can actually do something like env uh, cat local.env and then exags hyphen nine one, and then you can run your application. So this, this is actually, uh, how do I put it? So let's say if you have a password, uh, to a very critical AWS host or uh, some privileged uh, thing, uh, rather than you adding env directly, the other alternative is this. Like, I mean, of course, this will have to be encrypted and then decoded and all of that. Um, if I do echo dollar db password, uh, it wouldn't be visible. But rather, this is just available to this particular application. So this is sort of better than this. But this I have done just for the demo purposes. So yeah, uh, we are using uh, env config here, uh, and then all we say is env config process, and then we say hey, app server. Uh, one catch is obviously all the uh, fields have to be exported. Like in Go, export is basically if you have a caps lock, like first letter as caps. Uh, then these are all exposed. Uh, this particular variable, let's say, uh, is not accessible the other, by the other library. So because of which you will not be able to set this itself. Uh, yeah, you, you load it and then you use it as it is. And then if you want to change from env config to uh, some other library, all you have to do is change, touch this code 
and all of the other code uh, remains same uh, in your application. So uh, Dinesh, one question. Yeah, go on. Uh, so um, this uh, env configuration will it uh, like uh, do we have a, a default configuration and a local one for developer which is ignored file and we can uh, every developer can uh, um, like uh, append or modify extend that something some configuration and it will merge to the default one or how is it like uh, for env config no sorry i missed the question could you uh, could you uh, write and ask like is it yeah. Uh, in the normally, like in the env files, we have a default env file uh, with some defaults already mentioned, and that is uh, that is uh, added to the repo. And uh, we the, each individual developer, if they want a different configuration, they would create a local dot env file and uh, the, or development dot env file, local development dot env file, and then they will add their uh, their own custom. Um, uh, changes uh, values for those uh, in this environment uh, variables and right. it would uh, in uh, the application while loading uh, it will merge the uh, it will take the default and then merge on top of override that with the custom configuration uh, so, Correct. so is it is it something uh, like that in for env config module okay so i don't know what you mean by the default configurations uh, but i'll go here and then sort of share this for uh, db thing so, I mean, if your VM has default config, that's a different thing. But in while deploying, right, we don't have access to that. Like the deployment would have. No. Say, yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean? Sorry, go okay. on. Okay. Uh, what what do you, what he means is that uh, sometimes what happens is config files. Mm -hmm. You have three types of files: default, development, and production. Sure. In development sure. environment, the variables of default get overwritten, except the parts which are rewritten. In right. Productions. So that's like something like passwords. You 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 keep host uh, ports and those things constant over the well, in right. development production. What's same? Only the passwords get re rewritten in development production. Right. So in that case, we write have three files. I think dot envs don't provide that. Okay. okay. Uh, in uh, yeah, so like in uh, Node.js, we have that kind of a thing. Hmm. Uh, Node.js configs. Node yeah, dot env module has that. Hmm. Dot env module of our Node.js has this in npm. They have this like they override the local uh, environment uh, files. They have if we specify local hyphen development dot env and we ignore that file, that is basically something each individual developer they will add that local hyphen development dot env in their local and override some of the configuration for their own local environment. Uh, some of like uh, the those three files. Uh, uh, like um, default.env, development.env, and production.env, they will be committed. Those are some kind of a default. Uh, anyway, it will be overridden in the deployment by Kubernetes or something. But uh, something which the developer, uh, while testing it locally, if they want to use some, some other configuration, uh, let's say my they have a different MySQL username or password, uh, so they will be adding that in the local hyphen development.env file. And the uh, uh, application while loading, it will automatically uh, take the overridden um, config environment. So okay. that's, that's how the dot env module actually behaves. Um, so I'll I'll sort of clarify, right? Like I'll I'll just pitch for others as well. So I I do get uh, where you're coming from in Node.js and other applications, but rather I'll I'll sort of separate it. Do not worry about the ecosystem language ecosystem. So. In your case, uh, the dot env files, like, like there are some bash uh, command line uh, utils, which automatically loads the dot env file. So in that case, if I have, let's say something in uh, dot env, uh, it would be automatically loaded in my uh, space, like the env variable scope, right? So uh, for those cases, if it's it's almost like an overriding, but env config it's is purely reading from env whatever you have in this this place env that's what it's loaded in like that's what it's accessible in the env config. Uh, if you have two env files, you would have to source it. Let's say um, uh, source dot env and then let's say hey source uh, development dot env uh, and then run your application. 
so this is still needed so whether you have the default values by choice like how it is defined how, how that is done it depends on the language but you should have the values uh, defined here so if i do a echo something if it is available then the env config will have access it so in this case right i have some local dot env file uh, sorry dot env file but i don't have any custom setup to load this particular uh, configuration so what i would have to do this is still do let's say hey source dot env then if i do this then it's accessible but with respect to env config right whatever it is available it overrides it so in this case if i do source dot env and then if i do source local dot env uh, local dot env takes the precedence but what is better way of defining defaults in this case is uh, env config allows us to define something called defaults and those are something we don't need to define it so in this case i don't necessarily need to give db port in local dot env so the application itself has a con uh, default values uh and while running it you give all the other mandatory variables so the mandatory is actually mentioned by a required true so if you notice hey all other uh variables i've given some same defaults and then if you notice local i don't give max idle connections i don't give all of that even db port is not uh, like we don't need to give it so the application gives that flexibility so maybe while looking at libraries you can see uh whether it allows default whether it allows customization and things like that uh that makes sense right yes okay cool. uh if anyone else have, have questions as well do shoot so i think in in this case we covered like like different things as well so how it is the naming is uh naming uh, conventions are handled uh it allows default configuration so in that sense you don't need to define all the variables you give some same defaults uh and then the, while uh, reading it it reads it into a struct uh and then you can also say uh some are mandatory so if those are not available uh, it will fail uh if you don't have this then it will say it will move on like the, this is not sort of mandatory you don't have a default as well so i can change it to let's say say hey password it doesn't have to be required but in that case it will take the empty and then it will move on so in that sense it's much better to sort of say uh i always need a, a port uh and uh, i always need a host to be mandatory so if we don't have this our application would have a different error while running the application so we can just try it um so in this case i don't have a um host nothing is there so i'll just do a um, run so so example if you could see here right i think uh, uh, yeah it it says dial dcp look up random uh, no such host this is this is sort of harder to debug than let's say hey your configuration is not loaded so in this case i say required and then this will be um, much better yeah i hope i have the compile as part of this like i i don't have the okay, i have this let me just check um so this has required uh, i don't have the host uh, it should fail in uh, configuration but i'm just liking it, checking what is uh, getting changed so let me just rerun this for uh, running migrations oh it's it's failing in the migrations itself i guess so make l uh, cmd yeah so in this case you can see right error loading configuration uh, required host missing like earlier i had the migrations there it's failing for a different reason but now it's pretty clear that hey uh, these configurations are uh, not loaded and then like i, I don't know whether you have noticed in prod uh, if you miss some env variables it will fail and then while running it again we will figure out that there is additional env config which we need to add uh but in this case if you define all of that as required it will say all the variables which are uh missing uh in configuration and then it will mention at one shot so that way it's easier for us to sort of debug as well uh cool so uh any questions on the env config uh or uh how do you do uh loading and then using the configuration if not i can move on like i think i've taken more time in fact uh, if no questions i'll move on to the logging 
no question awesome so uh, j- just again like i think uh, have a look at the libraries internally like in this case configurations loading uh, use it from based on your usage and then uh, your requirement like i i wouldn't use a wiper for loading a yaml but rather there are some small libraries to load yaml configuration because wiper is like any format into this but it's, it's still pain like i i personally don't use it uh in that sense there is tons of libraries out there which is available so we can just try it out and then use what is uh like what works best for you um so logging right logging i i i think it's sort of similar to config right like irrespective of any service we ha- we need to have logging right and then we do have to log uh like like in, in a right manner with right levels to sort of debug properly uh, but there also like i've seen different services different repos and teams handling things differently uh, more than logging is mandatory i've seen like the the logging dependencies being passed around is a pain thing painful thing rather than a hey, it's set up nice uh, and and also like 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 i'm going to the specifics but rather how you define packages in this case also uh helps you easily refactor and then move to a different package uh, at later point uh, i i think recently there, there were issues with log4j uh if you use log4j across all the code it would have been painful to remove the dependency but imagine in this case uh you are defining a package uh called logger and then wherever you use uh logging you only call logger.rrf so in that case i don't need to change the whole uh i, I mean i don't need to touch the code across let's say cmd dbi migrations everywhere like like every other packages but rather I, all i have to do is change from here to some other library and then i'm sorted so in this sense i personally prefer uh logger as a separate package and the major another reason is like i i have seen something like hey logger dot setup and then it would give you a log instance uh, and then people have to pass across uh, people do pass across something like logger along with context now log becomes uh, another important important uh, like critical like not critical but as a mandatory thing to pass across everywhere uh, this also becomes a pain like it's an additional thing right and then it's not readable but rather uh, this i feel is much more readable so if i have any error uh so i'm just going here so if i have any error all i do is logger.errorf and then uh, you're sorted uh so you don't need to worry about the dependencies being passed here it's almost like a singleton or a dart package you are directly accessing the exported function so this i personally prefer uh then you creating a logger and passing it across for the mentions uh, reasons i've mentioned um yeah i think like the other things i look for is like obviously like it needs to have a levels but i think there is a blog on dave chain by dave chain as well like like we don't need that much of complex levels because one is we never enable like we don't usually enable like like warnings are usually ignored rather than being looked at uh errors debug and info i think that's the major thing i've also personally used um uh, in prod you usually want to have a like it like only critical error so that way you don't end up bloating your log files in turn um um like using so much of disk size uh, then you need to worry about log rotation and all of that right uh, but at worst case you would still require some debug log so in that case you can uh debug some specific flows so in that case like error debug uh and then info personally have worked for me but the point is if you're using a library uh like like in, choose a one which has log levels right and then you can enable a particular level and then disable all, all other le- levels and the other op- other important point is uh uh json format uh, or custom format based on your uh, need the log- logging libraries have means to mention what uh kind of output format you have like like i've, I've seen like mostly we have centralized lo- logging and then if you use some kind of a log search or other means you need to have a json uh that in turn like used by the library and things right so the format is also something which is critical because if i print a uh, a uh, uh, empty line like like if i print a line like this this is not searchable or this doesn't follow format but rather you have a particular format like hey this is the host name 
this is the IP, uh, this is the API, and then this is the status code and things like that. Like you have a key value pair, something like that. Uh, so you should have fields, like sort of a key value pairs available in the log libraries. Uh, and the last bit is performance. Like, like obviously there is again, tons of uh, libraries available. Uh, like I've used from like different libraries over time, like very early on, I used to use Logris, like that was uh, famous for uh, like JSON logging. Then I moved on to Zap because it, it had a much faster uh, performance. Then recently I, I majorly use zero log. Um, you should look at uh, benchmarks uh, while um, picking libraries. So in this case, maybe you can check, um, like, like I, I found some blog where you can see uh, the log risk performance is way higher. It sort of takes like 1500 nanoseconds, uh, but Zap takes 286 nanosecond and zero uh, log sort of takes 30 nanosecond. The reason this is very critical is because the number of uh, HTTP API calls you do, and also the number of logging we enable, right? Like, like we log like a lot of things in our flow. So in that case, the performance is super critical because this can cause or increase the latency for your API as well. Uh, so look at the benchmarks. Uh, you can also look at the metrics like shared here. You can see, right? Logris is way uh, down in the performance. Uh, be it the memory utilized or be it the uh, performance. Uh, so zero log and zap is in the top. Like like I've seen zap zap mentioning zero log. It's it, they are better than zero log. But again, like you can choose either of these uh, based on the constructs or the API rate right, interfaces. Uh, so here, like if you notice, right? Um, like I was using log package uh, before this. And then all it took me was uh, to uh, like sort of use a zero log. I just have to change this particular uh, log file. And then I got a zero log enabled. So it's easier to change the library. It's easier in the context of changing files. So this is way better, but again, the default, like this particular log doesn't have log level, right? Like, like that, that's a downside to it, the uh, default log. Um, so like, I'll, I'll just go here. Um, so in this case, as you can see, uh, like we always say, uh, like logger dot error. It doesn't matter what library I'm using. Just the last point is, uh, you have to decide on, uh, where to log things as well. Um, let's say, Hey, the HTTP handler is calling services. So in this case, I have service.total users. Uh, you could be logging here as well, or you could log in the caller as well. But I personally prefer log in the caller and in, in the top level, because that service can in turn call other, uh, DBs and stuff, but you wrap errors over time. Like you keep on wrapping, uh, like before you return error, right? Like this is the, not the like standard. Let's say, Hey, you do error fetching users. And then I, you do wrap, like it's a different than a percentage V. Uh, and then you return that. So that way you have the context on, uh, where the error occurred. So it'll be like error fetching users. And then within this place, it'll be like error fetching count from DB. So you will have the context on the whole error. It's not just saying SQL no rows. And then you log at the HTTP handler. So that way you don't have multiple lines for the same call, but rather you have a detailed log on, um, uh, detailed log on the whole flow, like just on the one high level, top level thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's that like, like I'm just sort of wrapping it quick because, uh, like I, I'm taking more time, uh, log at the high level. Like I personally use a single ten, like a different package. It's easier to replace a library or change the constructs or add a additional fields, additional context while uh, logging. Like, let's say I want to add timestamp. Let's say I want to change the format. It's way easier if I use a logger package. And the very important thing I personally like is I don't have to create an instance of logger and keep passing it around. Uh, because if I, if you look at logger's uh, library, um, like you would have to create a, a instance of it with the configuration. Uh, and then you would have to pass it around. So that's a painful thing rather than, um, using it at the high level. So as you can see, so you can see like, like it gives out a log 
uh, instance and then like you i've seen people passing this around uh, that i personally feel as a painful thing rather than uh, nice to have um yeah that that's pretty much it use benchmarks uh, use the ones these are the latest ones uh, like like zap and uh, um uh, the zero log uh, like zero log has much better uh, like implementation i guess like there is much more context around how it is implemented and why is it better but you can take a look at things and then pick ones which is best to you uh, any any questions any questions um dinesh uh, actually one thing about uh, logging so like performance impact uh, if we use uh, asynchronous logging uh, so will that affect performance uh, like it, will it improve the performance if we use async everywhere in Correct. the log you can you can so in terms of api latency uh, you would uh, save it mm. uh, but there is a downside mm -hmm. right um, if i have three apis if i have multiple logs if it's messed up then you wouldn't know uh, what order it is right so, yeah. so a, sorry yeah. go on um go on the next yeah okay so if you are fine with mismatch of ordering um, i mean it's possible that like one service is calling three apis uh, and then let's say hey the second api is the cause for a failure and then that in turn will fail the third api you would see like i mean what i'm trying to say is uh, one 200 or uh, two let's say for one and then three let's say 500 um uh, it's possible that you see this and then it would sort of confuse the callers if you are fine with that you can use it uh, but if not uh, the memory impact is still same depending on the library you use um, so yeah like again memory footprint is small in that sense it's okay but again like that's the major issue i see because we want to be the logs to be like exactly uh, in order while we debug it but if not i think i think it's fine you can do that uh, uh one more thing is about uh, distributed logging like uh, you sure. said uh, you have a singleton and you can reuse that singleton but uh, in distributed apis we have a trace id and which uh, uh, i previously talked about it like we have a trace id at the time when a new request is made so we need to uh, add the add that trace id to that particular um, log, uh, and uh, every time we cannot just add it to the uh, F string. So if we have a log instance created at the time of every uh, every uh, request, at the time of every request we have a log instance which stores that uh, distribution ID trace ID, then it can automatically handle that. Or should we? uh using even using a singleton maybe we can pass a context with that trace id uh, okay two bits so right. which one is sorry go on go on yeah close it close it yeah like uh, which one would be a better choice like if we create a um, instance every request or should we pass uh, the context to the singleton logger okay. with the so, trace id yeah i mean i'll just give a bit of context for others uh, so a, more in a sense that like, hey, if you are calling API from A to B and then B in turn calls Kafka and then that in turn gets called in C and D, uh, it's more valuable to look at the whole response time, this taking five seconds, rather than this service taking, let's say 10 MS and then this service taking 10 MS and then here it takes uh, 500 MS and things like that. So we capture the whole flow, like, like a stream of calls, like downstream, and then you club it all like that's the tracing bits uh this is not just specific to logging but rather for performance uh latency things uh you can know that hey the 500 is because of kafka is done or it's because of c uh timed out and things like that uh second bit is which one is like do you use a trace id like like a, there, there is an additional bit right so the moment you say hey you're tracking a log across like log is basically a entry of what happened uh, like if i if i have a timeout here it could be because of any of this b kafka or c or any of the services timing out like exceeding the limit uh, but i need to have some id uh, which i print across all services so if i say hey uh, one two three four in service a is actually timed out 
then I can go into logs of B and then search for logs one, two, three, four, and then see what was there. There, if it shows success, then I go into, let's say C and then verify one, two, three, four, it, did it error out? So in this case, it's 500. Like there are libraries to sort of uh, stitch, like it's called log stitching. And then this prints out multiple errors. So now coming back to your question, uh, the first level, you can use a UUID or usually I've seen like order IDs or a user ID being used as a trace ID. Uh, so that way it's easier to follow. Like it's not just random. And the second thing is irrespective of whether it is single 10 or whether you are creating a logger instance, you would still do something like a logger dot setup. Like, I mean, this could be a package or uh, this could be a log dot setup. And then I, I forgot the name, let's say, hey, open trace uh, dot something like, like you would use some middlewares. That setup you can still do for a singleton as well. So in this case, right? So I would be doing some logger dot setup, uh, and then within that setup, I'll be setting let's say hey log level dot um, setup level, and then read the configuration, and then set the level. Also, let's say hey trace configuration. Like we will be setting this irrespective uh, uh, whether it's a singleton or not. So you can still follow the same logger separate package and then call a setup with options. And then uh, the same works. Like you don't, like it's not mandatory to create an instance per se. Uh, like the issue is when, uh, like for each and every request, we are creating a new trace ID because every request is a new request, unique request. You will use so a middleware. You want to track. You will use a middleware. Uh, in the mid yeah, in the middleware, we will be creating our, uh, that setup, like we'll be having a, uh, instance of that particular logger, which will be passing through the context, or should we pass the context to the logger uh, itself, to the singleton logger, we can pass the context and the logger is responsible for getting the trace ID if it is present in okay. the context. So on a high level, like this, this doesn't support fields, but let's say it assume it does. Uh, in this case, along with this, I'll be passing something like a trace ID, and then I'll be passing a trace ID. So the logger, as I said, like it doesn't have to care about what you're displaying. Like it's just going to display key value pairs, whether this trace ID is ID or whether you're going to send it as a user ID or whether it could be a request ID, which is generated from the client. As long as you're printing this, you're fine, right? So you don't need to worry about this. Uh, if you don't want to even send this, then yeah, there is a different option of passing context and then using values. But I think this is even simpler. Um, uh, and the, the last call can do it. If you use context and then set this trace ID, the logger would have to accept context, right? And then you'll be cast, passing a context. And then there, before uh, logging, I'll be adding, let's say, hey, context dot, uh, value, uh, and then something like a trace ID. And then I'll be printing this along with the uh, format. That's it, nothing else. So you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah, that's what, like, yeah, exactly. That's it. So it doesn't matter. Like, like again, the library is ag agnostic. If it supports, great. But if not, it's as simple as, like, this could be via context or it could be just a string. Uh, but yeah, like, like, you can do the same thing. That's nothing else. Cool. Um, any, any questions? Uh, like, in fact, I can show you for the same thing. Like, I think in, uh, um in this which is zero log so info let's say we have as you can see right like it, it says dot timestamp and then that internally add something uh, but uh this supports something called fields like um you just need to set those fields and then you're good to go so this is saying str and then you can add something like a trace id and then you can set the tra id here Similarly, it could be a timestamp or anything, but rather the logger just accepts key value pairs. Here it's saying with the type, that's all. And, and this, this holds the same for anything. Logris has something called fields, logris.field, and then you would have to create that. Uh, but in this case, you just need to set this extra additional STR, which is going to be a trace ID. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Um, the, the code is simple. Like, like I've pushed a simple API in, in remote. Uh, you can take a look at this, like, and, 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 and it's more about how you are using this 
package and then how you pass it around rather than just a syntaxes or particular library. Yeah, just follow the benchmarks. You are good to go. Um, but yeah, like any of the questions or anybody else have uh, something to add, feel free to pitch. Uh, like like that, that's all I have. Yeah, sorry, go on. Just a small question. In a microservice environment, so uh, uh, where come where come where we are using the event logs like event log services there right like cloud watch and all so where we will use the those services so, so, sorry could you repeat um, like in in microservices um, so, it, where we'll use what uh, where we will use uh, event uh, um, sorry log event services like cloud watch uh, I mean, I'm not personally use cloud CloudWatch. Is it a aggregation like a centralized log aggregator? Uh, yeah, centralized log aggregator. Um, okay, Manoj, I can answer the question. Like, uh, we have been using CloudWatch, and uh, we use log loggers and uh, like use CloudWatch to add the logs in there. Okay, so is it want it will stream the log even to CloudWatch or? We will add it, uh, uh, aggregate in one particular log file, and then we'll. As uh, Dinesh uh, so showed, like we have a different logger file, and there we can switch, uh, like we can add uh, which uh, log uh, cloud logging we want, the cloud provider we want to use, and we can add the cloud watch there, and uh, it will automatically uh, log to cloud watch. Okay, so for each log event, it will go to the cloud watch, right? Yeah, we can add more providers as well uh, as per our requirement. Okay, got it. Thanks. So, um, I mean, I can abstract it a bit and then add this context as well. Like, um, so we talked about like just logging and tracing, but also centralized logging is also critical because, uh, as he was mentioning, like usually our production systems are of multiple instances. Uh, in Kubernetes, it's off replicas, right? And then the same service that's running in VM0, VM1, and VM2, let's say, if I make an API call from mobile, I would get a 500, but how would I know where it errored out? It could be from zero, one, or two. So usually what usually folks do is you collect the logs from all the VMs, and then you finally uh, push it uh, into a consolidated or like central uh, log service. Like, like in, I mean, I mean log uh, manager, whatever you call it. And then it's easier to search for that particular error. Uh, but the definitions of how the service logs, is it to a file, is it in the JSON format, or is it directly to the remote? I think I have mostly seen uh, dumping to a file and then further agents or a, like a different uh, workers collecting that log files and then sending it across, uh, like centralized. Because this is more of async rather than like let's say hey new relic is a, is a way different than like you, it's 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 different than like writing to something via API or via StatsD. So this is what I've seen. But yeah, this this is helpful for debugging distributed uh, microservices. Um, uh, one more thing, Adinesh, about uh, the ordering. If it is async, that I think uh, the um, cloud services might be ordering it based on the timestamp of the particular login. So that might not be an issue much if ordering is a concern for this asynchronous logging. Yeah. So if <laughs> yeah, if the provider provides it, great. Uh, yeah. Then I think it's fine. But there is one more catch as well. Like again, it's something very um, like like niche. But rather like hey, you shouldn't um, do any go routine leaks or like like if the go routines are too much, then also it's a problem, right? So as long as you pre-profed it, you profiled it. If it's all within the bounds, I think then it's great. But but the other problem is, let's say, hey, uh, what if those fails? Like, do you have a mechanism to sort of say the logging fail? Because sometimes I think we say, like similarly metrics, right? While pushing metrics, we want it to be asynchronous. But when it fails, like we don't want it to, do you want to stop the service? Or do you go on without the metrics? That's another small catch, like that's all. But yeah, I think, I think if the provider provides it, great. Um, any, any other questions? Uh, I'm, I'm good. Like, uh, I'm, I'm done. Uh, like if there is anything specific you want to go through the code, uh, happy to discuss. If not, like I would also suggest like maybe if, uh, you could share on like folks could share on like how 
your services uh, use the configuration? Like, do you use something different than ENV? And also, how do you sort of like manage the configuration uh, across org? Like, because like I, I, I think we would share something. Like, I have recently some found some Mozilla plugin where we encrypt the ENV variables. Like, because some of our services are critical. Uh, that that was something very different. Like, usually you uh, protect the resources it runs. But I've seen like recently uh, some libraries you can use to encrypt uh, with GCS security and things like that. There, there is a lot of levels you can do. And then deployments also different folks uh, do differently. We have not touched the polling, watch on config and things like that. But if some of you have used it, like feel free to sort of um, uh, share that as well. Um, unlike Dinesh, uh, so uh, our logging system is such that uh, we can use the custom, uh, like we have a local day which is ignored and uh, a local day uh, ENV and which is ignored by default. But if someone creates a new log local dot uh, ENV file, then it will be that that overrides the other default one. That's how currently our system is. So that's uh, more of a local, handling, but that is more local. manual. What about prod? Yeah. In prod, so prod. Uh, we are using Kubernetes. Okay. So, so Kubernetes overrides that. Config uh, management. You would be using uh, Kubernetes configs, yeah. right? Config maps. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But how do you sort of, uh, like, where do you maintain the config maps then? Like, where do you maintain the resource creations? I think uh, that was. That will be with the notepad of DevOps. Like. Okay. No, it's okay. Like, like the reason I was asking is again, that translate to some YAML files. Again, that is some key value pair. We would have to make yes, it. Yes. That's it. But mm -hmm. uh, like, like I, I wonder whether people have some like creative ways to sort of encrypt it, keep it safe. Because if I have access to the VM rate, I will figure out the credentials for DB. So that's what I was wondering. Cool. Uh, anyone else? Like, like, how do you sort of you like, like, do you use any services to manage the config? Any other JSON link? Like, feel free to share what you do uh, in in your deployment as well. Like, anything on logging or config different as well. Feel free to share that. If not, like, we can take like some open discussions as well. Like, like in in a bit. Any anyone else? Like, feel free to go. Um. I'm just going to ask some random folks then uh, who, who all like, can you just raise uh, like, Hey, anyone written prod systems? Not in Golang. Uh, yeah, but, but this is still common, right? Like contact management, uh, you can go. <laughs> so what we do is we keep it on S3 and only our system has access to pull it from S3. Um, but what format? YAML, YAML, YAML. Oh, okay. And My your YAML. system, when you say, hey, it's on while deploying on the VM process or does your services do that? Uh, services do that, but on the production, we have a shell script file over there. So as soon as a new deployment is hit, a webhook is hit, uh, we trigger that method, shell script. And we fetch before instance, before starting a new instance, we fetch right. it and then run the system. So in this case, it's not a ENV, but rather you have a S3 bucket where you post the YAML files. Huh. Deployment yes. will take care of bringing that S3 file into your VM, and then your application loads yes. the file and then uh, runs. And uh, the, the S3 bucket is only accessible to few people. Mm. Uh, is, is it encrypted? Uh, no, it's not encrypted. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not at all. We need to read also. But uh, the only difference is that we don't use .env, we use uh, config. There's a node package uh, named config, and that takes care of these functionalities because uh, what problem we face during a .env is that uh, it's a straight naming hierarchy, right? So it keeps on going. Hmm. And sometimes that becomes sort of annoying and frustrated to see. Right, right. Got it. Got it. So yeah. the ML was the choice for it. Got it. Well, I understand you have prefixes for everything, DB, server, some of the other. And that is similar to uh, that JSON's hierarchy, right? You have underscore, underscore. But that is still frustrating to see one, every code in the same hierarchy. Right, right. 
yeah yamal or tamil is readable but yeah i, I think it's just maintaining it like, like both works but for uh, like like sometimes i think even we in e and we uh, folks prefer because of like like hey would you have access to like that that like downloading do you have access to the traffic and what not right but i think yeah it's it's similar like it's it's all cool like this is the library i was talking about like the same uh, works for local.env or it could be for yaml as well but it's just mm-hmm. a additional thing where you use GC- gcs credentials and then you encrypt your yaml and then like this is slightly um, like more better than uh, just committing static wills no case vault okay some does someone use vault something mahendra uh, someone typed hashic of vault yeah vault uh, do you use vault key uh, secrets for your service mahendra you can share no. okay when when are you back in like i i think you can share uh, like it it's possible that like the service can directly access external things but i'm not sure whether like like performance wise i have not used it in prod uh, but yeah vault is vault is also pretty cool in in a way that like keeping the secrets really like we use it for managing certificates uh, but key value pairs i've not used that directly for the services <laughs> okay you're talking in chat uh like just before discussing open questions like i i see uh, eduardo uh, sort of mentioned he have something to share uh, like in general you can take this time now like do a short intro of your company uh, do share the job opportunities um, like it, it's not a pitch pitch but rather i think like we are open to uh, people sharing opportunities or referrals in your company earlier also we were doing in uh, our live meetups so but but be cautious of time like just take let's say 5 minutes or 3 minutes and then uh, you can share it uh, eduardo if you are still there uh, you can talk about your company in few lines and then share about the opportunity oh well, thank you so much for the opportunity dinesh and it was also a pleasure to get to know a little bit more about go even though i'm not a developer so um <clears throat> We are trying to spread this opportunity, especially with developers based in India, as we have several opportunities with one of our one of our clients right now, and they are focused on a cryptocurrency platform. They also they are also dealing with try um well I'm sorry with finance and trading stuff. So there you're gonna have the opportunity of using um, not only Golang as their main programming language, but also um, they are using uh, some devops tools such as docker kubernetes uh, aws services their main one of choice is going to be MongoDB, and they are relying on a couple of sql and no sql databases being those postgresql and mongodb all right so if you have any further questions or uh, if you want to touch base through email or on linkedin both anna and myself we are available to answer any of your questions and once again dinesh thank you so much for uh letting us speak in regards to this opportunity uh just, just sort of clarifying so others also follow like are you looking for a specific backend devs or are you looking for a full stack like i understand like you have a different stacks to work with it's not just specific to go but like is there any specific requirements you have actually for this main uh, partner of ours they are uh, we are looking for going engineers okay got it so go crypto space uh, anybody if you're interested i think you can reach out to eduardo like he shared his linkedin as well uh, and then his uh, x team as well so feel free to reach out to him thank thanks uh, eduardo for sharing this opportunity oh, uh, thank you dinesh <laughs> yeah a- anyone else like if you have anything like any open opportunities or if you have uh, like just put it in chat if you are looking actively for um a uh, job or if you're looking for let's say changing into go ecosystem because personally i've seen uh while having go meetups like there were few folks who worked in other languages and then through referrals they ended up getting a go job and then they started loving it so um i, I think feel free to share ask and then give uh whatever you have as well uh you can use the slack as well 
Like I'm not sure whether everyone is in Slack. There is a go for Slack channel. Uh, within that, there is jobs uh, channels. And then within like for specific to us, uh, you can talk to any anyone of us within India or Bangalore channel. Uh, you can sh ask any questions, share about opportunities or ask for uh, any uh, requirements or anything like that as well. Uh, cool. Like with, with that, like we're done. Like anyone else, anyone else has something to share? Uh, I have a trivia. Go on. Uh, a question. Uh, how do you take care and go applications, uh, layers like repositories, services and controllers? Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's we can have it on next semester. No, next no, no. I, think, also I think we are good. Uh, like we we can take it. Not an issue. Like like I anyways wanted to, um, uh, like keep it because, open. Because I, like, I, yeah. I so, feel so, I feel it's I, huh. I feel it's hard to find a uh, firm structures in Go compared to what it is for uh, the Node.js stack which I come from. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So yeah. so the whole MVC layer is a uh, like um is the, is what you're looking at right. We don't usually have a separate handler, separate repositories, uh, or um, like like it's, it's not specific to components, but rather we club it within, within the same package. So anything to do with the user usually goes in user package. Like listing, uh, controller, like in this case handler, repository also goes in this case. Like I've personally tweaked a bit and then moved DB as a separate thing, majorly because uh, like like the structs and the connections all need so. But yes. on a super high level, keep everything, including DV model, every, like models, you shouldn't have a model spec. It's that sort of anti pattern. So models, views, controller, everything, right? Like, like in other, whatever the other language terms here, you club it in a same package. Like you don't, you shouldn't depend on a separate package. The nice way to think about is let's say, Hey, the user package becomes so complex. You can move the package and then put it as a separate support uh, repository and then call it a service. So I understand you're, you're trying to say that modulize itself, right? Yes. So I, we do modulize, but the question then is, the, do you separate repository, all the database interaction codes into a repository file and the, anything that is a business logic into a service file? If you're okay, okay. Let me share this or the, or the divide the context. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, there is no, um, uh, the standard de facto standard as such, um, but handlers, you don't suffix it with, let's say handlers. Um, like I usually name it with, let's say, Hey, list, and then let's say get, and things like that. The service, I call it service and then store is called store. Um, uh, because what is more important is, uh, this place, right? Uh, you have something called user dot, uh, like it should be just list handler or it should be, let's say, Hey, fetch user. This is what is more important than the file names because the file names, uh, we don't bother about, but yeah, you could like, I've seen people appending handlers to it, but I think it, it, it would be as simple as like searching for a handler funk, right? That's it. The handler funk, I keep it in a handler funk or the server. I keep it in a separate file servers in a separate file. Like it's, it's better to create a service because, uh, there is much more than marshalling and marshalling. Decoding, encoding just happens, and then the store it's obviously logic. DB is a separate thing. Okay, so you do further divide in on depending on the context of the code, right? If not, it'll just become bloated. Like like you can have all of this code into the list itself. That will also work, but it'll just become that, bloated. That right? is, yeah, uh, that is not fair. That is not fair to other developers or any developer. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. So the same case, right? Like list is a separate uh, API. Uh, but both of them uses the same service. Like, like it depends, like there is no like standard or like, this is the de facto thing. Uh, if you can have a smaller service in the same file, it works great. But I think DB's handler service, like I have personally expected, like others can pitch in as well. Okay. Cool. So I just wanted to open the floor to like anybody else sharing anything, like, because like, we don't get to talk to folks. We don't get to meet folks and all of that. So I think like now I know, Hey, there are some people who's uh, repeat. So if there is any random questions, it could be even basics or it could be even different to go a production system or distributed system, anything feel free to shoot any, any, anyone of us will try to answer it. And if you're sort of like, like I'll, I'll just try to close the meet itself. Like, so in that sense, there is no mandate, right? Uh, do join Slack group. 
uh, there will be a lot of conversation. I'll keep on posting the uh, uh, meetup links over there as well. And then you can join a lot of good channels like New Buys, uh, GRPC. Uh, there is a good reviews channel where you can uh, understand how people write code and then people do ask reviews from other people. So in a way, you are learning from their learnings. That's a good channel. Uh, you can like do join the meetup. I'm, I'm sure like a lot of you have come from that. But if you're not joined that, like join the meetup, go Bangalore. And the other important thing is, uh, please uh, reach out to me if you have uh, a content to talk. Don't worry about like, hey, I've not written production system. If you have written some client tool, if you have written some CLI, uh, or if you have done, like if you've got any learnings, please feel free to share it. So in a, in a way, like there is always like 30 percentage of beginners in the group who, who doesn't have a contest and go. So it's way better to talk like the basics than let's say internals. Uh, so do uh, sign up. Uh, so yeah, that, that's all. Like the floor is open. Uh, feel free to hang out. Shoot any questions. We can discuss anything in general. If you're comfortable, turn on the video also. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for joining. I'll stop the recording so that way.